So when wishing to prepare samples for electron microscopy, obviously you start with your tissue sample, which for the majority of our pathological specimens would be biopsy materials. And we would place those into fixative in a jar. And the jar uh, contains glutaraldehyde uh, or could contain another fixative, formaldehyde, depending on what we have available and what type of tissue specimen we wish to use. Typically for electron microscopy we try to use glutaraldehyde. These, these procedures are described in the uh, book chapter uh, along with the processing that happens subsequently. We go from this stage with the fixed tissue, we have to go through a sequence of dehydrations and then we embed the samples in resin to produce the resin blocks. So we prepared the tissue as I've just described we end up with a, a resin block which contains our piece of tissue here. This is a much larger piece than we would normally use, but just to illustrate the idea. Here are some more realistic samples, so that one you can see is rather smaller. And this is a different shaped block, so we can choose to make blocks of an appropriate shape. What we need to do with that in order to get sections for the electron microscope is to trim the blocks down. Again, this is significantly larger than it would normally be, but we, we trim down with a variety of cutting methods, usually with a razor blade, to produce this sort of trapezium shape, which contains our subject of interest. This has to be small enough to fit within this chuck. The chuck, as you can see here, contains a very small piece of resin, and the sections that we're going to make will be even smaller than that. So having got our trimmed piece of resin into our chuck, the chuck will now go into the ultramicrotome here. The ultramicrotome is designed to cut ultra-thin sections, and the sections need to be that thin, about 70 to 100 nanometers, in order for an electron beam to travel through them and to observe the section of the material. So I place the chuck in here, tighten it up, and then the process needs to be of alignment so that I can take a knife right close to the edge of the resin block where the sample is and then use that knife to cut the sections. This is quite a tricky process and it's described in the book chapter. Here I'm using a diamond knife. You can refer to the relevant picture in the book chapter which shows this. And I place the diamond knife in the microtome and then I go through a process of alignment. So once you've placed the chuck in the microtome and the diamond knife in front of it, you can then manipulate the position of the diamond knife so that it comes very close to the part of the chuck, to the resin in the chuck where you wish to cut the sections. You can get it within a few nanometers and then you're in a position to begin the cutting process. In order to cut it, we first have to put some water into this boat or well in the knife so that when the sections are cut at the edge of the knife they float back along the water. We then use the motor drive of the ultramicrotome to control the position of the chuck and the arm that it's located in. By switching the motor on the arm then performs a movement which pulls back the resin and then pushes it forward by a set amount, in this case 70 nanometers. Does it again. And each time you cut a section, you take off the 70 nanometers, then it advances another 70 nanometers, so that you end up with a string of sections on top of the water in your boat. You switch the motor off, and then we try to collect the sections using these copper grids. These grids are only 3.05 millimeter wide. What we try to do now is place the grid under the water, beneath the sections, and we pick them up onto the grid surface. We can then dry the grid off, and that then will be ready in a little while to be stained. So once you've collected your sections onto a grid and they've been dried, it's possible then to stain them. And we use two kinds of stain typically. We use a uranium stain, uranoacetate, and we use a lead citrate stain. 
both of those are of course toxic heavy metal substances so I've now donned a pair of plastic protective gloves in order to protect myself from getting chemicals onto my skin. The procedure is to take the grids, place them in drops of the stain for the appropriate length of time. In the case of the urinal acetate we typically use 20 minutes. We then wash the grids in pots of distilled water, wick off using a little bit of filter paper any excess liquid, we place them in the second state. And in the lead citrate, this would be usually about five minutes. We wash them again, dry them off, and then store them in a box where we can allow them to dry thoroughly, probably overnight, before we take them into the electron microscope. So I prepare my drops of stain using a filter, or I can centrifuge them down and I put the required number of droplets onto a square of dental wax. And this enables me to produce nice round droplets to which I can place the grids. Collect the grids using these fine forceps and I put them into or on top of the drop of stain. I'll do that for all three grids. Place the lid on it and then I will wait for 20 minutes once the 20 minutes was up, I would remove the grits and wash them with 10 dips in distilled water. And I'll do that three times. And then gently dry the grits and then move them to the next state, which in this case is the lead citrate. So again, place the drop, the grid in the drop. And notice now that I have some sodium hydroxide pellets around the dental wax. This performs the function of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere around the grids, which would otherwise react with the lead citrate and cause a dense uh, reaction product, which is visible in the electron microscope. Once they've had their five minutes in there, I remove them and wash them as before in three pots of fresh distilled water. Then I would eventually dry them again and place them in my box for grids. So the grid is clamped into a special rod, a specimen rod, which we can insert into the electron microscope. This is where the grid is located here. And then I can move the rod up to the airlock. It needs to be an airlock vacuum inside the microscope and I press it into the airlock and allow the airlock to pump out so that there's a vacuum around the grid in the airlock. And once that's completed, which takes a few seconds because it takes time to pump the air out, I can then introduce the specimen sample into the microscope. So the vacuum is coming down now to an appropriate level that will enable me to place the rod inside the microscope. So once I've placed the grid in the electron microscope, I can then turn on the electron beam and I'm able to see the sample section looking down the column of the microscope and I'm able to then locate the area that I'm interested in. Once I have found that area, I can turn on the digital camera and so I can acquire an image that's live on the screen and I'm able to move that around to pick the area that I'm interested in. Here, for example, you can see a cell. This is in a section of brain tissue, so this is a neuron or nerve cell and you can see its nucleus in the center. I can move the sample around and so I can find other features of interest. Here, for example, is a very small blood vessel. And of course, because it's an electron microscope, I can magnify the image much more than I could with a light microscope. So it goes from a few hundred times magnification up to 500,000 times magnification.